Good afternoon. I welcome all delegates and our respected faculty to World Class E Symposium organized by King Edward Medical College Alumni UK in collaboration with King Edward Medical University, Lahore, Pakistan, and King Edward Medical College Alumni North America, Kamkana. I'm your host and a moderator of our session. My name is Asif Khan. I'm a consultant cardiologist at Nottinghamshire and a social secretary at Kemka UK. I start my proceeding by inviting Kemka UK chairperson, Dr. Mohammed Tufel, who is consultant pulmonologist at Glenfield Hospital, Leicester. Welcome Tufel. You can unmute yourself. Good morning and good afternoon, all the participants, whichever part of the globe you are joining us today for this Kemka UK COVID-19 World Webinar. I'm sure this will be a great experience for all of you because we have got a world-class faculty here and especially uh, the speaker from our first session, Dr. Faisal Sultan, who is Chief Executive Officer for Shogun Khan Memorial Hospital. And he has also been recently appointed as Specialist Advisor to Prime Minister of Pakistan. Since the inception of this program, he has taken this role as well, and we really congratulate him and wish him all the best uh, for this role. I would also like to thank my team, especially our moderators, Dr. Asif Khan, Dr. Vakas Ishtiakali, Dr. Abdullah Gujar, who have worked day and night to put all this program together. Our chairs of the sessions, Dr. Atar Saeed, Dr. Rana Hafizur Rahman, and Dr. Tabinda Dugal have been instrumental for this program as well. I'm really grateful to all the participants who have registered for this program, which is approved for category one CPD points by Royal College of Physicians UK. Now, I would like to invite patron of Kemka UK, the teacher of many of us, a great educationalist, Professor Khalid Masood Gondal Sahib, who is the current Vice Chancellor of King Edward Medical University, to say a few words and formally open this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, sir. Up to you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmadu wa nusalli ala Rasul al-Kareem. My friend, Dr. Faisal Sultan, Special Advisor to Prime Minister Pakistan, President Kenka UK, Dr. Mohammed Tufel, eminent speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. My heartiest congratulations to the organizer and on behalf of King Edward Medical University, I welcome the honorable speaker, national and international participant on Kenka UK COVID-19 World Webinar. Now everybody knows King Edward Medical University is the prestigious and historical institute where talent is polished. Its alumni is beacon of light in medical education, research, training, and service to the ailing humanity. Since its inception in 1860, in every challenging situation, and now especially in the COVID-19 pandemic, the graduates of King Edward has proved up to the task and provided their services at the forefront. King Edward Medical University alumni in USA, UK, and other country is the pride of our institution. In our student life, when I was a student, Dr. Faisal was a student, I think, I, I think at that time, the Kemkana was most active and vibrant. But during the last couple of years, Kemka UK has taken the lead. Dr. Tufel, Dr. Atar, Dr. Tabinda, they have organized a wonderful international symposium on health reform at King Edward Medical University. And we published a special issue of Annals of King Edward Medical University at that occasion. We continue with the international webinar and then weekly meeting on MDT on critical care with the help of Kemka UK. 
King Edward Medical University and its alumni is playing a pivotal role in COVID pandemic, pandemic uh, situation. Our attached seven hospitals, especially the Mu Hospital, have managed over 3,000 patients with good results. We established the Department of Telemedicine and we, we are providing the services, telemedicine services to over 5,000 patients. The telepsychiatry help desk is there, COVID help desk is there, and our 16 research projects, they are on way to publication. We have already published the special issue of annals of King Edward Medical University. Now every challenge comes with some opportunity. We have felt during this situation, there's a problem of human resource in intensive care unit, emergency medicine and infectious disease. And I'm very happy to see Dr. Faisal Sultan on the screen with his help, inshallah, King Edward Medical University will establish the Institute of Infectious Disease in its new campus, Kalasha Kaku Murid Ke Narawalgo. In the end, I'm very grateful to all of you, the Kemka UK organizing body, for organizing a wonderful international academic event. And I'm sure it would be a great source to expect policy decision based on evidence and sharing of medical expertise and knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Tufel, and thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, respected uh, Vice Chancellor Saab. Um, now, before I start the proceedings and uh, invite our first speaker, I wanted to uh, just mention some housekeeping rules. Uh, all the participants, we have so already crossed over 100, and we have nearly 350 registered. So naturally, a lot of people will be joining in between. I request all participants to keep their videos close as only the faculty and the delegate, uh, faculty and the speakers will get opportunity to be in the gallery. All participants will remain muted throughout this webinar, but they have full opportunity to ask questions. They will, can post, this quest, post their question in the chat section where chairs of our meetings will uh, pick, it, pick up your question and they will put it for panel discussion. All participants will receive their feedback form at the end of webinar. And on receiving your feedback, we will be generating your certificate for CPT points. All our speakers will be prompted at last five minutes of their talk by a bell sound just for timekeeping point of view. I will look also going to invite uh, Dr. Atar Said, who is chair of first session uh, in our gallery view. And Dr. Atar Said is a consultant gastroenterologist at Gateshead Hospital um, at uh, Newcastle. So I'm going to invite my first speaker with the 25 years of experience in medical and public health, the management of and policy making experience in NHS and countries like USA. He's a medical director of Public Health Scotland, Professor Mahmoud Adil. You can unmute yourself and you can share your slide. Welcome. Right, uh, good morning and good afternoon wherever you are in Islam Alaikum. Um, it is a privilege uh, uh, to be speaking today and thank you for the organizer to organizing it. It is an excellent knowledge sharing uh, seminar and hopefully it is going to help us and, and everyone who is listening. So uh, I'm going to talk about international lessons uh, for policy and practice. So as been told, I'm medical director for Public Health Scotland for colleagues who are outside UK, just to say that we are four uh, uh, in this countries within UK and they all have their national bodies who are responsible for public health functions. And in Scotland, the Public Health Scotland, in England, Public Health England, so Public Health Wales and Public Health Agency for Northern Ireland. So it is just like Pakistan that we have got health as a devolved function. So the purpose is that I need to deal with three questions that what has happened and its impact, what are health system response and strategies to manage it so far, and what are the policies and practice implications, which of course the lessons we need to learn and we need to implement. So let's start with the pandemic impact. So this is the state of the play from this morning some John Hopkins, uh, John Hopkins dashboard. So almost 19.5 million 
cases all across the globe. Uh, maximum in the USA, uh, UK is number 12, Pakistan is number 14, and India is number three. So uh, this is not a small thing. Maybe it never happened in the uh, lifetime of humanity. We are definitely dealing with one of the biggest challenge in the, in the, in the public health living memory. So to me, there are two types of pandemic impact. The first one is direct. That means the mortality and morbidity. I've just shown it to you. And then there is indirect. I call it collateral damage. So the collateral damage is actually the real challenge because it is, not going, to, it is going to have a long-term impact. So it means that the non-COVID or elective services backlog is happening and the people's finances are being impacted. So it's having an impact on physical, mental, and social well-being. The workforce effectiveness and morale is going down. Country's economy and GDP is affected. And of course, it is going to lead to increase in health inequalities. Yeah, just one example. So uh, talking about UK, so this is the death in hospitals by ethnicity. So there are certain populations in every country who are high risk. And I can show you here, this is the data which is being collected and the Asians are 1.5 times higher in, in Indian population. So these people are, so if you are an Indian, uh, uh, British, and uh, you have got 1.5 times of uh, chances of being died once you get admitted in hospital. Pakistanis are three times, Bangladeshis are three times, Black Africans are 4.5 times. So this is uh, one part of collateral damage. So basically, when we look at the impact of uh, COVID-19, we can define it into four curves. Of course, the first curve is infectious disease. Second one is the chronic diseases, which are already there, and they will get affected because of COVID-19. Third one is mental illness, and the fourth one, inequalities in included economy. So these are the four curves or the challenges we have got in hand. So let's see that what are the responses of the different, the, uh, different parts of the health systems. Basically, every country, they're doing their best to flatten those curves. But the challenge is they have to deal with the health impact on one side and the economy on the other. So they're juggling the balance all the time. So let's start from, so there are different strategies being implemented uh, in the world. First one, the first group is called elimination strategy. Basically, these are the strategies which are in place in order to eliminate the, uh, the virus. Starting with test and protect, basically you test your population and you, you follow, the, uh, the, the, you follow the, all the contacts and try to protect. Vaccination, once it is available. Third one is population immunity by natural infection, that's herd immunity. While at the same time, we need to protect the most vulnerable people. And the fourth one is border control because different countries at different phases of the pandemic, they had different, uh, they, they had the, the different curves. So what happened, for example, the Spain started in, the Spain has the highest number of cases than Italy, and then subsequently UK followed. So the border control became paramount, and, and then coming months and years, it is also going to be paramount, maybe months, not years. And the R number is very important, just to help colleagues that what is R number, because most of the strategies we are talking about, they are dependent on R numbers. It is a reproduction number. It, it uh, says that or it reflects about how the disease is going to spread. So it means that how many people are going to be affected by one person. And here's a good example, that if you have got 1,000 cases and there's no immunity uh, in the community, then if the R number is 0 0.5, it means that if one person is affected, it's going to affect uh, 0 0.5 people, or means the two affected people can only affect one person, then in 60 days, then the number will remain the same thousand. But if it goes to 1.1, then it is exponential. 25,000 people will get affected. So our strategies are basically based on the R numbers. If you and then the second type of strategies are endemic strategies. Basically, you cannot eliminate the virus, but you can make it endemic, local, and then you can control it. So we are using it, there are four types again. 
incremental lockdown, we also call hammer and dance. Basically, it has been done very effectively in Pakistan. Also, we are doing in the UK very recently in Leicester, in Manchester, Preston, Aberdeen. We, we, we lock the local city and then gradually we get releasing them. Uh, then letting this virus spread. I think the argument is that was that if you let the virus spread because you do not want to affect your economy, then there will be herd immunity. And good example, not good example, there are examples like Brazil, they, they let it go, but they were concerned about the economy. But of course, they were not, they did not have the resources to protect the most vulnerable people. Then the third one is the universal mass testing and screening, which is going on now. And then, of course, the, uh, the target and repeat testing that once you know what is the total number of people who have got the positive test, then you can go and repeat testing. So this is the endemic strategies. Then the third group of strategies are building extra health and care capacity. That means making new makeshift hospitals that happen all over the world, ITU capacity, efficient use of primary care, and the PPE and, the PPE and supply chain. Then very important that we all have different elements uh, within our systems. But what happened as a result of COVID-19, we started augmenting those system interventions. The first one is we do collect data, but data became paramount. And we became so, uh, first I realized how important is data, uh, how important the data is and how keen we are to mainstream it. Second is innovative use of telecare and telemedicine. Then, of course, we also develop volunteer workforce. These were the people who never touched the health before, health system before, but they are, now they are becoming part of the workforce who are helping the health and care system. Then modeling for planning in order to normalize the services. A lot of work has been done on modeling. Remote working is becoming norm. And of course, I do not want to touch on the financial side, but there are schemes for those being done in the United Kingdom and in Pakistan, there's a SAS program and they were trying to help people financially. So let's move on to the, uh, some uh, key features like interventions, health data. So what we learned that if you want to create value for any pandemic from data, then we need to look at that, what we can do uh, with the data. We can think about descriptive analytics, which is typical epidemiology, time, place, and person. But the real thing is that can we do predictive analytics? So we are very good, or at least successfully done in, in the UK and in Scotland, doing the predictive analytics. So here is a good example of predictive analytics that we have done enhanced surveillance data by bringing community primary care hospital virology data and number of other data sets. And in particular, we have we done the shielding, and you might, might be surprised that we have got almost 1.5 million people in the United Kingdom who, may, who uh, fell under the high-risk group or very high-risk group. We identified them within one week, and everyone was uh, notified within one week that you are a high-risk population. This is based on the data. Here's another example that in Scotland, we are able to identify with help of predictive analytics where those people are living who have got high risk to get admitted in the hospital. So I do not have time to go in details, but this is a good example. The SPARA program helped us to identify people who are high risk, and in time of COVID, it became very, very powerful. So let's move on to the last part of my uh, presentation, the policy and practice implications. So I think we all agree that in order to deal with pandemic or any other natural disaster, we need to have an effective, resilient public health system. When, when I looked around all the health system, or many of the health system around the globe, these are almost the 10 key features of effective, public health system. It is not public health as speciality, but it is public health as the health system which is serving the public. So we need, I will just go through two or three of them. Dedicated public health organizations, the countries who had dedicated public health service organizations, like in UK, I mentioned public health Scotland, public health England, and in many other countries, they felt they have got more resilient systems. And the other one was the surveillance and data informatics. Again, it became paramount, we need to be using it effectively. The public health specialist workforce with very defined leadership role became paramount. For example, when we had the local lockdown, we had directors of public health in every district. 
And that might be a very important lesson we need to be learning. We need to have a local, local leadership and local public health system. And then we need to have a very good governance and performance management at the national and local level. But last not least, the communication became paramount from prime minister and up, up to the frontline leaders, we wanted to give them a consistent message. And sometimes we were successful and sometimes we were not. And this means that we could not gain the confidence of the public for the interventions we wanted them to follow. So here's another example on policy, the return on investment in health uh, and the increase in GDP. So this is a very good study being done uh, from the University of Washington. They are saying that all the countries are divided into four groups. And if you invest $1.5 in high-income countries, the return on investment increasing the GDP will be $4.6, three times. And the Pakistan, of course, falls within the lower middle income countries. And if we add $0.4 uh, into our health system, the, 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 the result is four times, that $1.4 will be the return. So that's another lesson we, which we have learned as a result of COVID. Then modernizing the curriculum and skills. We started realizing for the last few years that our medical curriculum and our medical workforce needs to be fit for the future. And of course, the COVID told us a little bit more that we need to, and we, our workforce need to understand data and digital. Maybe it needs to be part of their undergraduate and postgraduate, and they need to be system leaders because we might be able to, uh, to, to have excellent doctors, but we need to create system leaders because COVID-19 did say to us, that you need to have it work within a system because individually you cannot make a big difference. So I always say that when I was in medical school along with Faisal and of course, uh, Professor Khalid Masood Gondal was senior to us, that we were uh, told that yes, we were uh, given excellent clinical skills. I think the time has come that we need to be moving from stethoscope to data scope. It means that we need to be looking at the population health, we need to be looking at the availability of data and we need to be managing the system. And then uh, the clini clinician's data literacy is an issue even in the UK. And I define this literacy as ability to access, understand, uh, use, and share data to improve health outcomes. We generate a lot of data and applied intelligence. But even in the UK, the clinicians are not aware that where that applied intelligence is so that they can use. So I have taken that. Uh, honest in, in Scotland that I need to raise it while in my role in Royal College. But again, this is a very important element we need to learn for the future. And here's a good example. Uh, different countries, they have learned from the previous experience. Singapore is a good example. In 2003, when we had the SARS, Singapore has one of the highest mortality along with Canada. The so Singapore said we need to go and look at a review of our whole public health system and see where the gaps are. They identified the gaps, they developed their national and then local public health bodies and institute, and look at now, even the Prime Minister of Singapore, he made a speech about two months back, and he referred, he said, look, when we learned from SARS in 2003, and here's the result, that Singapore, as compared to the US, or maybe you can compare with any other country, they have got such a low number of prevalence of COVID and such a low number of mortality. So now, what is the prescription for success, the recommendations? So let me sum it up. So the prescription for success, first of all, we need to say health is wealth. This is important because, as I said, we need to be met. The, the struggle with most of the countries were they were trying to think about if they have too much social distancing and too much lockdown, their wealth will be affected. It just means health is linked with wealth. But that, it does mean that the broader determinants of health needs to be dealt with. with and it means we need to be investing more. Transfer, transformation review of effective public health system, this is paramount. And I'm glad and it is a privilege that FASL has been given the new role. It would be great to see that how we can look and review the national and the provincial systems for effective public health system. One slide I show that which are the 10 elements. Applied health intelligence system, it is again very important that we need to have a good system of applied health intelligence. It means ability to change the data into intelligence which could be used. Cancer registries are a good example and there are diabetic registries, but we need to be thinking more. National and local public health service department leadership. As I said, 
that, for example, Punjab have 36 districts. It would be great to see that do we have local directors of public health? And I think we have got a good example of hands-on public health practice in the United Kingdom, and we need to learn from that. Then modernizing undergraduate and postgraduate curriculum. Again, I think having Professor Nahalm Su Gondal and being a very, a very proud uh, 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 graduate of uh, King Edward, I think we need to lead by example and thinking how best we can do undergraduate and postgraduate curriculum renovation. Built on augmented interventions, we are very serious in UK thinking all the volunteer workforce we have generated. We need to be thinking how best we can use them in the future. And I think the same thing for Pakistan thinking that a lot of people came forward. They said we want to help. Even in where I live, the neighborhood came. They said we want to help the older people. So they became part of the health workforce. So health is defined as physical, mental, and social well-being. Not the healthcare services. Everyone needs to be a clinician. So if we have built the momentum of having more volunteers, we need to think that how best we can utilize them in the future and we can mainstream them. Telecare, telemedicine, again, it has become very, very important part of the delivery of health services we need to build on. And then uh, we had a lot of discussion with our colleague, um, in, um, the King Edward colleagues uh, in the USA that how best we can improve the primary care end of Pakistan. And this is important because what we learned during COVID that while our hospital got shut, but we have a registration system that every person is rest, registered with the GP. So we had a fallback position that, and we have got a primary care system. It means that we have got a referral system. So we need to be thinking how best we can develop. So people shouldn't be ending up in A&E for things which can be dealt in the primary care. Hospital without walls. Talking about telecare, telemedicine, and having a virtual community hospital, it is becoming a norm in Scotland now and the primary care uh, services. So my last slide is that this is our call to action. We can learn. Of course, this, uh, this seminar or summit is for learning, but I think we need, to go, we need to go further than that. Thinking about how best we can share best practices and how best we can work together on a certain set of agenda and how best we can show the leadership. So that if we can show that leadership, the people who are Cancolians and others who are across the globe, we need to help. It is not what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for excellent talk and just right on the time. So as a moderator, I will now invite our second speaker. And I all, as a moderator, I want to congratulate again, Dr. Faisal Sultan on the new portfolio of Special Assistant to Prime Minister of Pakistan for Health Services in Pakistan. He is a CEO and consultant infectious disease of State of Art Shaukat Khanam Memorial Hospital and Research Center in Lahore, Pakistan. Dr. Faisal Sultan, you can uh, uh, share your screen. I'll unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Uh, everybody's been very kind. Uh, thank you for your congratulations. I think um, in addition to the congratulations, you might want to send some good wishes and prayers because this is uh, sometimes a, a tough position to be in. Um, I will also uh, uh, would like to also remind everyone that uh, my Shaukat Khanam role is uh, I've stepped down from that to focus on the present role. So um, that's been given to the acting chief executive there. Okay, so what I'm going to do over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is to give you an approximate idea of uh, what we have done, uh, what the general challenges and the response was, and uh, where we are today, and a little bit about where we think we might be going in the next uh, year or so. Sorry, um, Dr. Sultan, can you speak slightly louder? I think the mic people okay. are in the parts. Let me, yeah. let me try to see. Uh, yeah, that's slightly getting better when you close. That's better. Okay. So, um, in terms of uh, where we are today, a little bit, uh, a quick sort of overview. We've done nearly 2 million tests so far, and the per million test is about 9,800. We've had 283,000 positive cases so far, uh, 6,000 deaths, um, which, is, which translates to about 29 deaths per million. Generally, a low number for uh, a country like, uh, a low number globally, but uh, nevertheless, this is, uh, you know, this is a work in play, and we really uh, need to be, uh, careful and sanguine as we go along. Um, I think my, for some reason I lost. 
Okay, uh, so what I'm going to focus on is um, the key challenges and some of the key challenges involved uh, the issues of data. I think Mahmood uh, Adil mentioned the issue of data and I think that is central to this entire story. Anybody who's not uh, or any country entity that has not paid enough attention to this uh, has suffered. Uh, the other issue was, of course, uh, the buildup of capacity, um, then the domain of communication and implementation of all these ideas because ideas uh, are great, but if they cannot really be put together, uh, then that's an issue. A little bit about where we are uh, on the current trends and then uh, going ahead. So what were the challenges? I think if we summarize these, one of the biggest problems that we faced or that was there was the very devolved federal structure of governance. I'm not even sure that most people realize how extremely devolved health has been within the Pakistan federal structure as a consequence of the famous 18th Amendment. Uh, on top of it, our health system generally has been weak and uh, there have been challenges both of data flow and of creation of that data. So in many situations, the data did not exist and when it existed, uh, for it to flow in both directions was and remains uh, a challenge, but I think to a large extent that's been surmounted. The other key uh, challenge around which some of our strategy has been built has been communication, a little bit more about it later. And then of course, uh, how to actually put this together. Now on data, one of the bigger issues that we faced was uh, data governance. In many situations, uh, data was owned, generated by provinces, sometimes even at sub-provincial levels. Um, who owned it? The federal government certainly did not have visibility for many of these data points. Uh, then there was the issue of even where data was created, how did it flow into the system? All the way uh, from a laboratory, from diagnostics, to where oxygen was and oxygen beds were available and ventilators, uh, visibility about trained manpower, uh, the availability and accurate and um, uh, properly deployed uh, personal protective equipment, and of course, information about deaths in a country where there is no normal death registry. Uh, the deaths are registered at the local uh, municipal level, uh, but that communication upwards does not happen in the normal course of events. And then of course, when you do create capacity, the real challenge has been of central visibility. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but the fact is that when you start to fill up the health system, uh, it is crucially important for decision makers and deployers of um, services to know exactly where beds are and where uh, expertise exists, uh, because you can have a shortage amongst uh, plenty. Uh, in fact, some, some of those, some of people amongst you who may have studied famines would know that very often it's not the total amount of food that is short, but it's uh, distribution and its distribution networks. The other challenge, of course, was not just the availability of data, but of its analytics. Earlier in the epidemic, modeling was crucially important because all you had was very sparse data within Pakistan, and we were dependent on models from all over the place. And I must tell you that with time we realized and we built our own modeling capabilities, we realized that uh, modeling done from afar was not only grossly inaccurate, but also tremendously damaging and misleading in terms of creating capacity. <clears throat> the other area where data analytics were very important was contact tracing and the use of technology to uh, empower contact tracing, the conventional boots on the ground contact tracing augmented by uh, technology and uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, additional uh, means to track and trace people. The other area where data analytics came in extremely handy was the creation of hotspots. And again, instead of doing this manually to use technology to generate hotspots and thus to target and limit um, this, uh, the lockdowns. Now, a little bit about capacity enhancement. At the present time, the capacity to do uh, uh, tests is about 50,000 tests per day. This went up from about 100 uh, a day in February. And you can imagine in a country like Pakistan where um, you know, deploying essentially a molecular test in the far reaches of areas where uh, even ordinary uh, diagnostics may be weak has been a challenge. But I think the NIH and as augmented by the NDMA really rose to the task. And I think we had great partners in uh, private laboratories and public sector laboratories in nonprofits 
from small to large, and I think this has been a huge success story as far as Pakistan is concerned. The other issue was, of course, oxygenated beds. And at the outside, we had about 5,000 ventilated beds uh, and uh, a lesser clear number, if I should say, of the total number of oxygenated beds, because of course, as you can imagine, um, you know, that there are gray areas within uh, in that domain because it ranges from all the way from low flow to high flow and, uh, uh, you know, steep apps and bypass. So therefore, um, to create this capacity was a challenge. Ventilators were, of course, in short supply everywhere. Everybody wanted uh, a piece of that action. And so uh, availability and deployment was an issue. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it uh, in a bit. We had another uh, shortage, which was, of course, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, and I think every country more or less faced it in some degree or the other. And we are in the happy position of having gone from uh, shortage to having enough to now uh, export and give to other countries. Uh, you know, the textile industry and other as associated industries were able to retool and re-engineer very fast to create uh, personal protective equipment and including uh, N95s, which were a little bit harder to get going, but then um, uh, we are good there as well. Now, ventilators, while indigenous production takes a little while, but it really sparked the, the interest and um, zeal of a lot of uh, uh, local people to actually either design or copy designs or adopt design and put uh, designs and put uh, them into place. And we've started to see uh, production of local ventilators, which I think uh, perhaps hasn't contributed to the present uh, story, but will to the future by bringing in other, uh, you know, a whole industry of uh, healthcare um, equipment. Healthcare workers, of course, uh, always short supply of people in subspecialty areas like critical care and infectious diseases or lab diagnostics and so on. Uh, but uh, I think here as well, we were able to train um, a lot of additional uh, people to at least be able to take care of basic uh, needs for uh, patients with COVID. In terms of communication, we have had uh, again, some uh, not so unusual challenges, but uh, some with uh, a local twist. Of course, uh, there was a flow of information and one of the interesting uh, um, analogies I read somewhere was to try to fill a cup of water from Niagara Falls and good luck with that. So there was such a flow, such a massive flow of information and then even experts found themselves uh, bewildered by what to believe, what to take care of, what to read, what not to read. I think all of us uh, in the late hours of night or early morning um, deploy, you know, used our capabilities to read in a more targeted fashion to enable informing others. But I think this was a bigger problem with the public because there it was not just information but misinformation and it was very difficult to tell the two apart, especially when credible and highly uh, you know, respected bodies also kept changing um, their guidelines, understandably as the data changed. But this, was, this is something that was very hard for the public to digest and understand. And I think it created uh, a reduction in trust of the healthcare system globally, but uh, certainly within Pakistan as well. Now, within Pakistan, there were other issues. We almost had two countries. We had a polarized public perception of threat and uh, you know, how it was looked at. Now, there was the educated, uh, Western elite, which of course knew everything about Spain and Italy and UK and China and so on, and of course were going hoarse crying uh, for uh, lockdowns and severe lockdowns and extended lockdowns. And on the other hand, there was the other country which really had no uh, experiential aspect of this and uh, were almost um, unfazed. And therefore, to address the public messaging to both parties, which were really on two different ends, uh, was a challenge uh, to bring together uh, some coherence. I talked about guidelines and credibility. Um, and of course, the healthcare workforce became extremely jittery and fearful at one point because they started getting the brunt of the epidemic. And I think there, there, there became a situation, there came a situation where uh, there was extreme polarization from the decision making to uh, some of the senior healthcare workers who felt that enough harsh shutdowns and lockdowns were not being done. Now, coming to uh, implementation. As I mentioned, because we have an extremely devolved structure, to the extent that uh, I, I don't know if you, if many people realize that there was a time period for about a year or two when the ministry that I sit in ceased to exist. Pakistan did not have a central or a federal health ministry for about two years or about a year and a half. 
And uh, so, you know, it is the, the Federal Health Ministry, or as it's called, the National um, Health Services Regulation Coordination Ministry, was actually built from scratch. So uh, some years ago, and so therefore, um, the some of the entities and structures that existed prior to this, prior to the 18th Amendment, uh, may not have been great, but at least provided some coherence. And this was um, completely gone at this point. Then the other problem, of course, was uh, politics and the and balancing disease prevention and societal impact. At one level, the federal government had its own uh, mandate and agenda and direction to to address all these things, whereas more local entities. Uh, were of course, uh, uh, you know, focused and targeted, understandably, on the local impact on healthcare systems and their own uh, provinces and cities. So this coherence had to be uh, uh, brought in. We also, of course, without um, you know, uh, without question, had this triple crisis of health, uh, then poverty, and and food. Uh, and as somebody mentioned, I think Mahmoud Adil mentioned the SAS program. Uh, I think that was crucially important to do this uh, very transparent, large cash disbursement to at least tide over the extreme period of shutdown for those people who are actually dependent on um, wages every single day. The other issue, of course, in implementing all this was the tailoring of lockdowns and restrictions. Now, Pakistan went into a lockdown mode around the 23rd or 24th of March. And after a few weeks, uh, there was a graduated and gradual lift up of those restrictions based on industry and density and so on. But uh, how actually the, the larger decisions were implemented uh, and could be implemented was another, implement, uh, another challenge. Uh, I will give you an example. Before Eid, um, the idea was to actually uh, lift restrictions from what was decided as neighborhood stores or neighborhood markets. And as you can imagine, in a diverse and complicated country, all the way from villages to towns to larger cities, uh, this definition uh, was was fudgeable and 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 was confusing, and so therefore, in many situations, entire large markets opened up. Then, of course, uh, 210 million people, uh, independent-minded and not very uh, amenable to being told to what to do necessarily, um, to try to enforce something out of them is tough, and there was tremendous administrative fatigue from in within our systems to actually make this happen, and um, this was also one of the challenges. Now, the, one of the solutions, one of the grand, great solutions that came about was the NCOC. Now, looking back, I think that uh, bringing everyone on the table, including the, the health ministry, but having it chaired by, uh, by a federal minister from planning and having a, uh, you know, an extensive set of uh, civil as well as military leadership sit there to have a coherent, coordinated response across all the provinces to sit every day with the chief secretaries and um, you know, other leaders within the provinces to bring more and more coherence and credibility to the response. I can tell you that in the beginning, there were, uh, you know, doubts and people would question, but eventually uh, trust was formed. And I think this, is, this will go down as, as, as the world learns, uh, learns about it. This will go down as one of the most coherent um, responses because of the creation of that entity. So where has it brought us today? Now, uh, we started out um, you know, with very low numbers in March. Uh, but as you can see, uh, around about um, the, in, somewhere around mid-May, the numbers started really uh, climbing up exponentially. And we do feel that this was uh, the net result of the general opening up that happened in the days before Eid. 11th May was the day that a general opening was done. And as, as you can see, six to 10 days after that, the numbers started to climb, climb up. But one important thing I'd like to uh, point out and mention is that uh, in April, um, around the third week, we had actually started contact tracing, which was uh, nicely labeled as TTQ here. Um, and this contact tracing, I think, has been crucial in trying to stem uh, onward spread. And we have some ideas as to the uh, quantifiable impact of uh, some of this. Then uh, we, we masks were made compulsory again towards the end of May. As the data evolved and it became clearer that uh, they held an important key to, to pivoting things. Now, compulsory uh, is, 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 uh, is a term, but when, when you actually implement it, it, what it meant was that at least in closed public spaces, there was uh, an expectation that uh, masks would be worn. And there was greater, uh, with time, greater compliance of that. Then uh, compliance for the standard procedures was also stressed a week or 10 days down. And then uh, right towards the, just, just around the peak of uh, our epi curve, uh, the hotspot lockdown expansion was uh, put in place. 
So many of these things were incremental steps, but um, targeted to the need of the day. And uh, you know, around the third week of June, we started to have a general decline, which initially we were, you know, of course, unsure about. But as the numbers stacked up and gradually became more consistent, uh, we became more and more sure that indeed, uh, at least the first phase of our uh, epidemic was coming, of our epic curve was coming down. Now, one of the things that you will see is um, the fact that the, the, the blue line is the numbers tested, and that goes up and down. And you know, you see this huge dip. That's ETH. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about it. But as of today, last evening, yesterday in that single day, uh, 23,000 tests were done, 63, uh, 634 were positive, which is a 3% positivity and eight deaths. And I'll show you some details of this data in the next few slides. Now, the other thing that gave us some comfort was the decreasing positivity percentage with time. Uh, we were in the mid twenties. Uh, and then of course, it's gradually come down to single digits for the last many weeks. Um, in addition, uh, this is the death epi curve, if you will, and we, st we re re relied a lot on this information because, of course, this is hard information. And we had a peak death day of 153 uh, in uh, late June. And from there on, it's actually steadily come down. And we are now in the single, single digits most days. But the average uh, in the last 16 days is 19 deaths per day. Uh, this is the daily census. In fact, this probably is one of the hardest indicators and probably the most reliable one. This is the fill up of the healthcare system. Reds are vent beds, blue is those on oxygen. And after a certain date, we split them into low flow, high flow. But what's plain obvious is that uh, from a peak of uh, around 17th to 20th June, we've actually had a gradual uh, steady decline uh, in the fill up of the system. So we are quite confident that across all cities and all domains, um, the numbers have truly indeed come down. Uh, major cities snapshot, I will not dwell on this too much, uh, but the fact is that you can see that the positivity rate all across is, is now low. Uh, it is variable, but you know, it's all in the single digits, at least for the major cities within, uh, within the country. Uh, the percentage occupancy of ventilators, for example, has gone down tremendously. What you see in Islamabad is 24%. This was in the high 70s at one point and so on. So Karachi used to be in the 60s and June it's 11% now. The hospital ramp up, uh, Mahmoud Adil also mentioned building of capacity and you know uh, we decided to actually add um, uh, 2000 beds uh, in June and July and you'll be happy to see that uh, we exceeded that number by going up to 2600. So we, in another few days we should have about 2800 additional uh, oxygenated beds in the country. This was all, of course, powered uh, from the federal side, but done within provinces with the help of NDMA. A uh, slide about lab tests per million, I won't dwell on it too much. We still, by global numbers, have done low tests. But uh, as you can see, Islamabad, 100,000 per million population, really rivals very, very advanced countries in, in many situations. Now, where are we going and where can we expect to head? Now, we do need to do de-escalations. And uh, the one that I particularly worry about are the educational institutions. I think all the data around the world is that that is going to be something that will again uh, make or break the second wave, if you will. We have just uh, decided to open the restaurant industry from, the, uh, from Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, but uh, educational institutions will be likely mid to late September. And uh, I think uh, that still remains a challenge on how it is to be managed. International travel has gradually opened. We really suffered some of this time. What we don't know is what we will have in the future, whether it will be a wave or more waves or wavelets, or whether there will be a whack-a-mole and we'll keep having small uh, eruptions here and there that will require smart targeted lockdowns. And of course, spikes in secondary towns, because there is some evidence that zero positivity is somewhat lower in, in smaller towns as compared to the larger cities. Um, we do need to think of uh, you know, pharmaceutical uh, interventions and also evaluate the impact of NPIs, especially in lo low resource settings, because even in the harshest lockdowns, uh, nothing was really truly shut down. Of course, we all know winter is coming and we worry about it. Uh, and uh, we do think that we may get a little heads up on it from colder countries, from countries in the Northern Hemisphere that may actually suffer a winter effect earlier and may uh, tell us uh, about what is coming for us. Vaccine, of course, uh, is, is being talked about is the current talk of the day and how it is gained and deployed. And it's really almost down to betting on various horses and which horse wins and whether you bet on it or not. 
is going to be a great challenge for every single country, I think, other than those who can actually place a bet on every horse. So I will stop here and uh, would like to thank you all for your extremely patient listening. And I think the questions perhaps will be at the end. Thank you very much for a comprehensive talk, Dr. Faisal Sultan. And yes, there are loads of questions which we'll do discuss at panel discussion. Our chairs are picking up these questions. And as you mentioned about vaccine, we are we have presented all the data, epidemiology, but the main person now we are looking at, our key players, our virologists, and our next talk on medical virologist perspective, Dr. Mohammad Raza from Sheffield Teaching Hospital. You are next, and he is going to talk about our diagnostic control and vaccine. Thank you very much. Right, guys, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, we are okay. Okay, thank you very much uh, for asking me to come and talk on uh, on this platform. Uh, 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 it's, it's an honor uh, to talk to fellow Campolians and people from around the globe. So, um, one statement I, I would like to say here is that I can't really just uh, summarize everything which has happened in the last six months. So, but what the aim of my talk is just to give you enough information for you to understand what has been talked about. And on that basis, I'll just list what the, the outline is. So I'm going to talk about the viruses, how the human body responds to it, what are coronaviruses, some aspects of diagnostics, and the attempt to go back to business as usual the timeline of our pandemic, a bit about vaccines, and some summary thoughts, which uh, uh, may, be, uh, may be useful. So viruses are uh, very small pathogens which we come across throughout our life, and almost everybody is affected. You could see um, somebody who's having a cold, a respiratory virus infection, somebody with a red eye, somebody with chicken pox, a very nasty neonatal herpes, and herpes simplex and replitis are some of the common themes which you guys come across. Now, let, let's look at what a virus is. Viruses are a very, very small microorganism. And one thing which differentiates between other organisms is that these are not able to survive on their own and they have to re rely on infecting a host to produce the required components for their offspring. Now, how small are these um, uh, organisms. If you have a look at this, uh, um, the scale, you can see all the way from the humans uh, up till uh, up, up, up till uh, where the limit of the human eye finishes, uh, where the limit of the microscope finishes, uh, is where the viruses uh, start uh, showing their presence. And you can see here, in comparison to an Intel resistor, that's what the scale of the the viruses is. Now, a, a general structure of each virus can be uh, represented uh, by what the coronavirus is. And you can see here, uh, the cartoon representing the shape of a virus. It's like a round tennis ball, and there are club-shaped surface projections, which in this case of coronavirus are the spike proteins. It's the largest known RNA genome with up to 31,800 base pairs, and it's a single-stranded um, RNA virus. Now, one thing which you will come across, especially if you work in the lab and you're looking at the diagnostic assays, are the genes. Now, the genes are present on the RNA, and um, they are the spike um, uh, genes producing the spike um, uh, proteins and the antibody responses. The E envelope, which, which is a sparse protein in the membrane, uh, the membrane embedded M protein, and the ORF, 1A, and 1B, which is a huge polyprotein, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So you can see here in this picture, the outer structure, which actually is quite important in terms of the humoral responses and how the virus behaves are quite important. And you can see here, the important thing is that the surface projections are responsible to bind to their specific ACE2 receptors with the help of these enzymes, TMP, RSS, which you don't have to remember, by the way. But once it goes into the cells, the virus just goes into a vacuole and then empties itself. This whole cellular structure then is responsible to produce these viral proteins, the RNA, and then the progeny viruses. Now, the key thing in all this uh, is the RNA, which carries the messages 
across uh, into the progeny and the, um, the cellular proteins uh, and, and the cell, cellular machinery. But if you were to uncoil this RNA and make it a linear structure, this is what is represented here from the 5 UTR to the 3 UTR, you can see up to 30,000 base pairs. Now one part towards the 5 UTR region is what you call the open reading frame and there are two types, 1A and 1B. Now you don't have to go into the details of what open reading frames are, but the important thing you need to recognize here as that these parts of the genomes are responsible to, for producing specific proteins. And the NS represented here are the non-structural proteins, which typically are enzymes. On top of this, the ORFA 1A and 1B, uh, the 1B contains the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is uh, something you will come across, um, RDRP. But the important thing is, uh, are these the structural proteins, which I've just talked about the spike. So there is part of the RNA which is responsible to produce the spike, the E, the M, and the N. And the reason why I'm stressing on this is that some of your PCRs are responsible to pick up these particular genes. So you will come across commercial PCRs which are picking up the S gene, the E gene, or the RNA, or, or, or the RNA. In our experience, the PCRs based on the E gene are the most reliable. It comes um, as the earliest protein and the gene, and it comes uh, and goes away quite right at the end. So this is the detail of the, uh, the ACE2, uh, which uh, binds to the, uh, the, the viral surface projection. And one way of um, controlling this infection is the use of monoclonal antibodies. Um, the convalescent plasma, what it does is it just blocks the, um, the, the, the surface projection and it just stops the virus from attaching the cellular uh, receptors and therefore stops the infection. Now, while this is happening, and I'm, I'm just going to give you a bit about the immunology slide. So whilst this is happening, the uh, immune system is busy uh, controlling infection, generally speaking. There are specific cells called the antigen-presenting cells whose job is just to hover around and look for intruders. So as soon as they find the intruders, they engulf it. And part of the intruder is then dis displayed or it's, it's just uh, expressed on the surface of, of these uh, these 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 dendritic cells. Now, as this the expressed antigens are presented to what we call the helper T cells, the helper T cells become activated. Now, whilst this activation is happening, there is another series of uh, the, the lymphocytes, which are called the B cells, which are just present and they're just hanging on to these uh, pathogens, waiting to be triggered. So as soon as they're triggered, what the B cell does is it starts to produce plasma cells. It gets converted into plasma cells and memory cells. And then it starts throwing these antibodies onto these pathogens and therefore try to control the infection. Now, this is what a vaccine does as well. And whilst this is happening, uh, there are some other bigger pathogen controlling cells in the body, which then start engulfing uh, and getting rid of this pathogen. The memory cells is what the vaccines do to produce memory so that when you do come across uh, the actual pathogen, it quickly recruits these B cells and the T cells and is able to control uh, the whole thing. So this is typically what you do. You produce you, an antigen in the form of a vaccine. You give it to a child as part of the childhood vaccination program. And then ultimately it leads to an immunized child by the process and the steps which I mentioned earlier on. Now, another important thing to remember is that, you know, I talked about the activated T cell then going and chatting with the B cells. The, the way the communication occurs is in the form of very small chemicals which are produced as a result of uh, the activation, which are called the chemokines. The, they, they, they could be lymphokines or the monokines. But the important thing here is this is what is important in terms of communication. So in case the communication goes down, you, form, you, you find some immune disorders, but in case the communication is oversaturated, all of a sudden there's a big spike, which is unnecessary, you get cytokine storms. Now, from a COVID point of view, there are two distinct phases of this infection. The first one is where the virus replicates, uh, go, comes into the human body, and then goes away after five, seven days. 
uh, some cases for uh, when it's leaving it does something to the immune system which then uh, makes the body thinks there is a big threat to the whole human body and it produces what you call the hyper inflammatory phase what you call the cytokine storm all these communicating proteins the chemokines they are they are being they then start being produced in such high amount and concentration that it just destroy starts destroying various systems of the body now to control the initial phase uh, you've got drugs like remdesivir which act on the virus directly and to control and and what is happening with the hyper inflammatory phase of the cytokine storm is that it starts to destroy parts of the the human organs and in this case uh, it goes and destroys the, the the lungs and in an attempt to control this people are using what you call the tocilizumab and an important point here is that if your patient has not developed tocilizumab then you don't there's no uh, hasn't developed the cytokine storm there's no point in giving tocilizumab so uh, that's how it works now what is a coronavirus and i'll take you back to 1965 when some american and some british um, scientists found uh, they cultivated or grew a novel type of common cold virus which had not been recognized by that time and they named it one of the early forms of uh, coronaviruses which we now uh, know by the word 229e and you can see here gradually over the next decades we discovered more and more coronaviruses and as we discovered these the severity kept on increasing and you can see here till nl65 63 things were okay sars cov1 created problems mers coronavirus is still there still causes problem people returning from middle east and sars cov2 we all know about the important thing here is that there are four distinct group of coronaviruses alpha and beta and it's only the first two which infect the humans and if you look at the various distribution between alpha beta and gamma you can see here the subtle differences between each one of them and it's the genus b where your troublemakers are the sars and the mers and the uh, the covid 2 and you can see these differences in the base pairs which then differentiate between the uh, the various pairs and important thing is the um, the 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 main uh, species from which the coronavirus appeared is thought to be the bats so therefore if you hear in the news that yes it's found to be uh, from the bats is actually because the, the the generation came from it now why am i showing you these pictures is because coronavirus is present in every single one of these species i've listed here so coronavirus is not something new it has been present for a long time we only found about this in the 1960s and we continue to see new species now just going back to the structure of the virus which is quite important for me to explain so you can see the glycoproteins the spikes we talked about so it's glyco and protein then you've got the rna and you detect the glycoproteins uh, with the help of antigen tests so it is an antigen antigens by definition are proteins rna is not an antigen it's the actual genome and antibodies are antibodies because that's one of the whole human responses in protecting uh, the whole um, host and its uh, various systems so what typically happens is if you get exposed to an infection there's an incubation period which they say is up to 14 days which i don't personally believe i think it's about 5 6 days after the incubation period uh, is uh, when the symptoms develop it's acute onset cough fever sore throat and loss of taste and smell and one of the mistakes i think our community overall the health community did at least in the uk was to put a very narrow definition of covid it is not just cough it is not just persistent cough it's much more than that they are even asymptomatic in covid now as the symptoms develop what happens is in the very very late stages of incubation period about one to two days before the start of the symptoms you start seeing the virus in various compartments especially the respiratory compartment and you can detect the virus directly by using a technology to pick up rna in the form of nucleic acid amplification techniques pcr is one example then you can look at the virus directly you can culture it or you can try to look at Uh, an electron microscopy picture or you can try to detect the proteins which are external part of uh, the virus itself by uh, with the help of lateral flow assays like the pregnancy test or elisa which are uh, the typical gold standard nowadays for antibody or uh, antigen testing now what then happens is the virus goes away and as the immune system is trying to fight it off 
it starts to um, develop antibodies. So ultimately, most people, the antibodies win, the antigen is kicked out, and it takes up to up to 28 days for, uh, for people to develop antibody. One of the important things here is that when your diagnostic assays are picking up antibodies, they sometimes can't differentiate between, uh, say, a SARS-CoV-2 antibody or the seasonal corona antibody or the SARS-1 corona antibody. So it's important to have the right analytical char sense, uh, characteristics of your antibody, in this case, the sensitivity over the, over the preceding weeks we found uh, better assays coming but the sensitivity has been as low as 85% and specificity giving people false positive is another thing which we were very worried about. So one thing which comes uh, as a quite a common question now that we are more doing more and more PCR tests on uh, our patient is how long do people uh, become remain positive for? And as a general principle, uh, PCR positivity remains uh, till the symptom onset uh, and then goes away. But in some people, a group of people, what happens is uh, that you see a, a long-term shedding. And in stem cell transplant patients, we've seen the shedding go on for more than a year. So that's the extent of it. And certainly, we've got people who are coming back six weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks after their original infection uh, and, and looking for this uh, PCR, uh, finding the PCR positivity. Now, a good way of finding out whether it's actually clinically relevant is to rely on culture positivity. And that's what people do. But it's uh, it's quite a laborious technique. It needs a, a specialist uh, knowledge and expertise, and not every laboratory has got it. It's not cost effective at all. Uh, your private laboratories will not be keen on doing it, and it has to be done in a reference laboratory. Now, just a very tiny, tiny time on uh, PCRs, what PCRs is. Everybody talks about PCRs. Let's, let's sort of go into the detail of it. So imagine you put your sample in a very small tube, what, 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 uh, in, which is quite commonly used. It's at room temperature at 22 degrees, imagine, um, in, in, in England. Um, what, what you uh, do is you raise the temperature from 22 to 95 degrees. Uh, and what happens in this then tube is that the RNA then starts to uncoil. You then reduce the temperature to 55 degrees, and what happens? And, and then what you do is you attach an anti-coronavirus RNA to this virus RNA. And if it's a PCR for flu, you will add an anti-flu RNA, and so on and so forth. You also add a sleeping fluorescence, which is which then at this temperature goes and attaches to the RNA. The temperature is then raised to 70 degrees. And then what happens is the sleeping fluorescence, which was here, then gets activated and is read by the machine. It continues with new RNA strands created. You can see here, the one becomes two, the two becomes four, and then the whole uh, the step is repeated by raising the temperature back to 95 again. So the uh, changes in temperature from 95 to 70 uh, in a serial way is called a cycle. And one cycle changes one copy into two copies, and two units of fluorescence are released. In the second cycle, four copies of virus are created, and four units of fluorescence are released, and so on and so forth. So we typically run a PCR for 45 cycles. Billions of copies are made, and each fluorescent unit stays there. And the billions of fluorescent units uh, which are released are picked up by the machine, and then you know which cycle your PCR became positive. So all these CT values you uh, hear about is the cycle at which the PCR became positive. So what has been the role of a virologist? I mean, I'm talking about all these uh, viruses and uh, what, what were the challenge, uh, uh, challenges in terms of running a service. We, we still have to run a comprehensive clinical virology services because uh, yes, everything changed to a COVID machinery and we have to do um, all sorts of different asks from the central government, all the local challenges. But for example, your stem cell transplant population, they still need their PCRs, they still know all, all your advice, and we were busy in meetings and all sorts of different development strategies, etc. So that was the biggest challenge. How do you make sure that your routine people do not suffer, your routine diagnostic service continues to run? You then had to give clinical advice on, on a relative unknown entity, and that took a lot of effort in terms of keeping yourself updated. Establishing patient and staff testing pathways to make sure people who do need the test, they get the test, and people who do not need the test, they don't get the test. And that's one important point which I would like to mention here is that we in the UK do not have an inherent 
um, how should I put it, the uh, conflict of interest when it comes to uh, private laboratories. Everything is uh, NHS laboratory and we decide who needs a test and who doesn't. So it's not like everybody, people come in and they get the, they pay the lab and therefore they get the test. We would just challenge any test which is not required. So our job was also to maintain a COVID-free hospital. So somebody coming in for a surgery gets COVID and therefore the mortality rates go up, the morbidity increases. So it's our job as hospital specialists to make sure that you do not give these infections to other people unnecessarily. Provide data feeds to public health, and uh, we've talked about the importance of data, but this is what we have been doing over the last two decades. We are very good in uh, data links. Uh, prompt control and um, uh, develop policies for outbreaks, and we've had a few outbreaks where one staff member has led to secondary cases, one patient has led to secondary cases, and then a, a series of investigations then happen, which is controlled by us, and all the diagnostic and all the patient placement uh, strategies within the hospital are then decided to happen to by us. We always liaise closely with the Public Health um, England, and uh, whatever, it's a two-way communication, especially with the local guys, but one of the critical criticism in England has been, with, and I'm sure there will be repetition, is that there was over-centralization of things and people were not allowed to do much at a local level. And as virologists, we had to liaise with the central PhD laboratory. The data was flowing automatically in the background, but it just other diagnostic and therapeutic and, and also policy matters which required uh, a, a national strategy. We had heavy involvement in the infection control services and we also had to look out for other impact. For example, if your patients require a phlebotomy, for example, somebody takes the blood sample, then who takes it in a, in a way that you don't compromise your staff or your patients and you don't stress it. So it's, it, it, it's, it's a quite a challenging um, a time. But one important point I'll mention here is that we've been doing this job over the last 20, 25 years and at a very, very, very small scale as compared to the pandemic, we've got all these policies in place and, uh, and it's just a matter of scaling it up. And, and I'm by no means saying uh, that this, this, this is what, what uh, is pandemic is, but again, the core principles on which the whole pandemic strategy has been built are already known. And of course, then the other players come in, like the, the whole uh, government, the ambulance bodies, the, uh, the public health and the big responses from the government. Uh, Downing Street, uh, Street directly handling some of these uh, uh, policy matters. So the timeline over the last six yes, months, Thank you. Uh, what, um, what we have done and achieved is that you uh, got the first notification of cases in January with the uh, novel coronavirus. Uh, 21st of January is when we uh, got our first case and then we were quick to develop a, a novel case, uh, a novel PCR all by ourselves uh, with a published paper from Euro Surveillance and uh, it was quickly rolled out and the proficiency, proficiency panel which Public Health England were keen on us testing, uh, that was passed and we quickly uh, were live with our new PCR. All this along, we had to develop all different policies to make sure the test results were back for patients who were in the hospital and the whole isolation of patients and all the PP usage was dependent on getting the negative results. So there was quite a delay from uh, our sample taken, uh, going to the reference lab and the results coming back to after one to two days. But when we started doing the test, the results were available in about six, eight to 12, up to 13 hours. And uh, one of the challenges uh, which, which we had was that all of a sudden there was a big shortage of uh, PCR kits. And our testing almost uh, came to a standstill, but then we were quick to develop what we term as the extractionless PCR. That was validated within a week, and then we were up and running. We appeared in the BBC Look North, and at one stage we were doing about 10% of the whole UK testing. So just to cut a long story short, uh, we uh, had a lot to do, and this is just brief points in terms of how we, uh, the, uh, how our response was. Now, a bit about uh, vaccination. What is herd immunity? We've talked about it. The herd immunity, the, the main thing is that you create enough people so that when, uh, who are immune, 
so that when new cases of infection come in the community, the disease doesn't spread very far and the whole community remains safe. Now, if you look at the history, uh, when Columbus uh, discovered America, when HMS Dido uh, went not many uh, visitors before, there were mass um, deaths because of new infections because the population was naive and they, they, they did not have herd immunity. And for, for you to say the vaccine has to be developed quickly is very easy, but actually, if you look at it, there are phases, there are testing points which the vaccine has to go through for it to be declared as efficacious and also as safe. And the phase one, phase two, and phase three comes all the way and it takes, and I'll come back to the timeline, a typical vaccine uh, takes up to 10 to 15 years. However, uh, if you do have the accelerated board, which we are at the moment, then what you do is, instead of uh, compromising on the phases, what you do is you just speed up the administrative process. And where it takes six to eight years in the clinical development, you just spend much less time. But still, look, it's one to two years, and uh, there are about um, diff there, there are about uh, I'll come back. So, uh, so this is the timeline. So don't assume that the vaccine will be available in uh, no time. Now, the type of vaccines you can take a virus, you can kill it, and then inject that as a form of uh, a vaccine. You can pass it in culture so many times that the virus becomes weak. So that's called live attenuated virus. Now, you have got recombinant vaccines where you put various uh, components of the virus and make a vaccine out of it. And there are about 26 candidate vaccine on the WHO register at the moment as of 31st of July. I'm not going to talk about any more details and you can uh, do your own research and, and try to get it. One word of warning is have a look at this poster. It says almost every dose of polio vaccine, this is going back to the 1950s, 60s, produced in the world was given to approximately uh, 20 people and was contaminated with a, a cancer-causing uh, virus from the monkey kitty used to develop, which is called the SV40 virus. So this scare was created as a result of the vaccine. And then another phase one trial for one of the drugs, the person almost died. So it's, it's not straightforward as develop the vaccine. You have to look at all the side effects and the safety profiles. And a lot is there in the literature talking about the polio, the cutter incident where you gave somebody for polio vaccine and they actually contracted polio. So yellow fever, there is a post-vaccine encephalitis, and then there's a yellow fever vaccine associated with stroke disease. So just be aware that it's not as simple as just saying, let's get a vaccine. And there are loads but, but Raza, of- Raza, we have uh, less than two minutes, please. Thank you. Yes. So, um, Right. I don't know. Let me just see. Your your warning has uh, been heard by the computer at least. Can you can you see my screen or is it just gone? I think uh, you can go back. Yeah, that's back. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Right. Okay. So, uh, what is going to happen to to the virus? Uh, and what, what uh, whether it's going to go away or whether it will remain. What I've given you here is the total representation of what the seasonality of viruses is. You can see here in winters, you get all these uh, respiratory viruses uh, like flu and RSV, metanema virus, uh, and, and then you get peaks of rhino across in spring and autumn. And a uh, few others are, are plotted here, but where is the seasonal coronavirus? So one uh, possibility is that the SARS coronavirus will remain and uh, will just become a seasonal virus like the, the coronavirus or like the others. Or the other one is it's just gonna completely go away or it's just gonna be there around, around, around the year. Now, the seasonal coronavirus is predominantly a virus of the winters as uh, shown in the, this paper, but I'm just gonna skip this now and just go, gonna give you a summary, uh, last two slides. So virologists, what is our role? Uh, we are essentially, in addition to being diagnostician, uh, giving advice, and helping our infectious disease colleagues and also the whole rest of the physician community. We act as secondary care public health physician as in within the hospital. A lot of uh, threats which have been, which have, uh, we've come across uh, or there's a threat in the future, there are viruses, Ebola, influenza pandemics, novel pathogens. So we, we are quite involved in the preparedness. Our local laboratory rose to the challenges uh, despite all the supply issues. 
uh, and we were uh, quite okay to, uh, we did well with the national ask and challenges. We had full support of our hospitals. The workload was immense. It continues, but in other words, but that's a dis different discussion. And we are very worried about the possible impact of uh, flu virus with the coronavirus. But again, let's see whether the uh, uh, vaccine comes through. And preparing for the future. And I always think in any country, you need to have a central reference laboratory uh, like Nice province, which provides rationalized testing free of cost. You recruit people who can develop local policies and contribute to national ones. You recruit virologists, epidemiologists, biomedical scientists, public health specialists, and medical virologists' role is crucial. And with the help of reference laboratory, you, you then establish uh, diagnostic labs in the public sector in other cities and embassies. You train for super specialties and send them for MTLI schemes. Talk to us and we'll help you out. And then there is a role of professional colleges and professional bodies. And I think that's a crucial role which is uh, if there are so many policies out there, there is so much misinformation, I think it's the role of uh, the professional college and the lines of broad colleges where you tell your physician what to do. And what to avoid is, and it's a very uh, interesting term used by my colleague, was that uh, avoid WhatsApp, avoid the super virologist, avoid uh, Medrex. And I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, Medrex without peer review paper. It, it adds to your confusion. And please avoid superficial read of articles because that doesn't help. And on that note, thank you very much. Thank you very much for excellent and comprehensive talk. Now I will I'm going to invite uh, our chair of the session, Dr. Atha Said, consultant gastroenterologist, to take over uh, for the panel discussion and invite other panelists and co chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Asif, and also thank you all the three presenters for their excellent presentation. Uh, so let me introduce my co-chair, Dr. Shafiq Gill, who is the Head of Diagnostic Services in uh, the Sherwood uh, Trust area, and also Dr. Mohamed Abed, who is currently a Professor of Public Health in al Ain University, and Professor Saira Afsal, who is the Professor of uh, uh, Community Medicine and uh, Preventive Health in the Ganyu uh, University. And of course, uh, my um, uh, old friend and colleague, and Dr. Professor Khalid Masood Gondal. So we have a few questions uh, lined up. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll ask uh, the first round of questions, and then I'll ask Shafiq to uh, ask the second round of questions. The first question to Mahmoud Adil uh, from Diyad Chaudhary. So what was the state of pandemic preparedness in the UK, especially Scotland, before it struck? I think it's a very open-ended question because one of the, the things I mentioned that uh, the public health systems, uh, uh, we need to have a public health system in place in order to deal with any pandemic and having a public health Scotland as a central point, we were able to have a good surveillance and uh, we were pretty much prepared to deal with any sort of outbreak, but not at the size of this pandemic. So it would be naive of me to say that we were fully prepared. But when I say that uh, we were prepared for other, because of our, our communication and data flow, which I think uh, Faisal mentioned, uh, was pretty good, still very good. So these are the key ingredients. We were confident that we would be able to advise our ministers and advise our first, first minister to, to make the relevant strategies. Uh, but where we were uh, not well prepared was that our workforce and our hospital systems were really overwhelmed. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up question, uh, Mahmoud. Why is it that uh, the East Asian countries were thought to be much better prepared? They acted quickly, taking the non-pharmacological measures, and they kept the infection rate very low. Uh, there's a postulate that this was because of the previous um, SARS epidemics. Do you think that is a correct assessment? Sorry, which country are you are comparing with? East Asian, so Hong Kong. All oh, right, okay, Far East. Yes, I think that I mentioned Singapore already because that is a good example that uh, they were. But I, again, if you look at from epidemiology, uh, if you look at the number of deaths in the UK, uh, and 1,000 uh, people, and we compared with other countries, uh, you can say that whereas you have got a good public health system, but why your outcomes are not as good. It is too early to make that, make that comparison, but in terms of uh, uh, time, place, and person, 
uh, there might be a difference in the viruses, might be difference in people, because our population, for example, 18% of our population is over 65. That might be different in other countries. So that is where the impact is. But as far as your question is concerned, you're spot on. I think they learned from their previous experiences. And I think this is the first time the whole job had dealt with a big pandemic, pandemic like this. If you remember SARS, it did not affect us at all. Excellent, thank you. So a question to Faisal uh, by uh, Mohammed Tufail, the Arkamka president, uh, the very dynamic president who has been behind uh, setting up this webinar. Professor Tufail was asking, how did you coordinate data between the center and the provinces? Uh, because you've outlined the difficulties of a devolved system. Right, so what was done relatively early was that uh, we were able to, we looked around at what would be um, an appropriate conduit as well as final database, final placement for this data. And instead of building one anew, uh, the one thing that could easily be co-opted into this service was the NEOC, the National Emergency Operations Center, which is the polio database. It is fed polio-related information from you know, thousands of uh, entities across the country. And so what we did was we retooled uh, the database so that it could receive data on uh, uh, corona tests, for example, and then uh, it added some fields in it so that uh, it, this became the nerve center. So the data was fed uh, all across the country. And one of the important steps to do was to actually connect the labs that were reporting data. And because currently there are over 100 labs, what we did was that in every province, we asked them to connect to their, labor, uh, to their provincial dashboards. And APIs were created um, between the NEOC dashboard and database and the provincial dashboard. So that if I'm a say a small private lab in, in Lahore, I get a test, I enter the data, it gets fed into the Punjab database, which then onwards uh, can push it or the, NAS, the NEOC can actually pull that data uh, uh, towards its end. So a complete connectivity was created. Now in Punjab and Sindh, they were very effective uh, and later on in KP, very effective provincial dashboards that had existed. For other provinces, we allowed uh, a more manual and more indirect approach. So this really required a lot of back and data plumbing that was done by the NEOC, by Digital Pakistan, uh, and by the NITB. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, or it's a combination of uh, different people who've asked a similar theme of question, which is the virulence of the virus and the um, susceptibility of the population. Uh, the question is directed to Raza. Uh, Raza, there is a theory that the virulence of the virus may have changed or be, uh, may have diminished uh, in countries like Pakistan, where we have seen a slightly unexplained um, uh, low death rate as well as um, diminishing uh, new infections. Um, and there's been a lot uh, of uh, discussion regarding our natural immunity or immunity acquired through vaccination, for example, BCG, or previous viral infections uh, that we would have had in, during childhood. So the question really is, uh, uh, virulence is it different and susceptibility is it different in our population? What do you think? Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, they're doing any sequencing in Pakistan, but I can tell you we're part of the COG UK trial, which is uh, getting all the positives across the country and then uh, going, letting them through the sequencing machines. And uh, one of the characteristics of this virus is that it has got uh, proofreading capabilities. Now, what that means is that the chances of getting different strains are on the lower side, which is quite different to other viruses like influenza. And what we have seen so far is, for example, as part of the outbreak investigations, that the virus is actually quite tightly packed within its uh, different subtypes. So uh, I don't believe the strain differences are great. However, there have been some point mutations or very little number of mutations which have been reported to have some effect on the way the virus uh, goes on. But these are initial findings. And, and going back to um, your point about the BCG vaccine and all the other characters, these are all hypotheses. And even... Um, I don't think anybody can prove or disprove them. And you know, your, your guess is as good as mine. So early days, they may find out later on, like the link to TB and the, the vitamin D. Uh, 
as, as long as I know, at this point in time, things are not very clear and people who are claiming it, they need to come up with data because I don't know otherwise. Excellent. Thank you. So I'll pass over to uh, Mama Shafiq Gill for the next round of questions. Shafiq. Thank you, Dr. Said, and really excellent presentations. I think I have a couple of questions. One is for uh, Dr. Fessel. Uh, I think it's a question from Dr. Abid. Uh, in terms of uh, how would you sort of look at further improving the sort of public health systems in Pakistan, and especially with the focus on public health workforce? Okay, thank you. So one of the first things to do is to make sure that whatever learning has been done um, with COVID does not get lost. And whatever pipelines have been created, data pipelines and uh, the ability to evaluate and uh, run uh, uh, epidemiological models, statistics, uh, AI is not lost. And so therefore, um, what's on the cards and very quickly, inshallah, is uh, a series of uh, acts of parliament where the National Institutes of Health will be revamped and a Centers for Disease Control, a proper CDC will be created within the NIH. Um, and there will be a data center, an Institute for Data Center, an Institute for Laboratory Studies. So some of it exists, but actually, so, so a, you know, a complete revamp of it will be done. And an essential remapping of this temporary NCOC that was created, the National Corona Command Center, will now be created within the, uh, the CDC for a normal CDC Pakistan, for a perpetual uh, ability to not only receive data from the provinces for diseases or conditions of interest, but for then analysis of them at a central point, something that we were doing at the NCOC with the help of our team. And then of course, the administrative arm to actually connect back to the provinces and cities to ensure that uh, what is uh, decided is sent across. And of course, a very, very powerful communication arm. So I think the, the, the NCOC will morph and in fact, um, will create a successor organization. Uh, uh, this was already in the works, actually, you, you may be pleased to know that this was already in the works for the last six to eight months. But as you know, legislation takes a little time because you have to convince uh, everybody across the political spectrum. But now there is great receptivity for this problem. Just a couple of days ago, there was this visiting a team of senators from all parties, and they said, how do we go from here? And I said, well, look, if we get off from this table and don't make the CDC Pakistan, we're all culpable. Thank you. Just a quick follow on question on that in terms of different countries have responded differently this, to this unprecedented challenge. So would there be a sort of a structured learning exercise just to capture learning from this experience? Oh, absolutely. It's being done every single day. So there's a lot of institutional memory that exists right now in, in looking at what we did, where we went right, where we went wrong, how we retooled our efforts and so on. So I think all that's um, you know nicely captured and curated, and uh, some of us are writing this up as well initially in 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 in, in uh, uh, medical and other uh, publications, but eventually also as a compendium of um, you know the, the entire uh, Corona effort. So I think this learning must not be lost because we did a lot of um, uh, important steps that should be at least kept in mind for the future. Thank you. I think it's another question from Nassim Vadaj in terms of uh, they have been, uh, there has been really rich data coming from all the countries, but there have been questions sometimes in terms of looking at the, the validity of that data, whether it's for testing, whether it's for uh, people becoming sick or mortality. So what's your view on the data coming out of Pakistan? Has there been any validation exercise there? Sure. Tremendous. On a single everyday basis. Uh, part of the problem is, and I keep hearing this, so what the data is this or that. Look, at the end of the day, because you don't, we sometimes don't see many great stories coming out of Pakistan, there's a great sense of disbelief that as if, you know, this, this data is either bad or patchy or hidden or manipulated. Um, so for each of these data sets, whether lab, deaths, ventilators, oxygen, we have a secondary set of ground truthing. It is not just fed into the system. We actually have liaison officers within each of these places to actually do ground truthing. Every time there is a mismatch or a disconnect, we go back and drill down and find out what is going on. I'll give you an example. At one point, there was a story in, in a Karachi paper saying that, well, you know, deaths were, deaths were being missed or underreported. So we actually went out and said, okay, what's happening? And so what was happening was that people who are arriving dead, for example, and this happens in every large accident emergency, emergency room everywhere in the world that some people will arrive 
who are dead on arrival, who are so unwell that they're either not CPR or uh, receive a brief resuscitation and it's decided they're dead. So these dead or nearly dead on arrivals, uh, there were some. And so we said, okay, we corrected our system. We said, okay, every single death on arrival will actually get nasal swab and PCR for the presence of the virus so that those quasi or those gray, gray areas would not get missed. So I think a lot of effort has been made to uh, put in to make sure that what the data that is coming through is indeed correct and accurate. Now, data is never perfect unless you are dealing with a very small set and you're looking at countries like Singapore or, you know, New Zealand, small countries with old systems, you are bound to have some fuzziness at the edge of the data. But the idea is to actually reduce that fuzziness and at least have the data which is statistically speaking reliable enough that it provides you with an accurate snapshot of the situation. Thank you. Another question for uh, Dr. Adil. It's from Swamia Iktadar. Uh, how would we know or how would we be able to say that it's over or is it something we would have to just learn to live with? Well, I think that's very interesting. Uh, uh, as far as the definition of over is concerned, it is pretty clear that we need to be thinking what WHO is saying because you cannot decide things at the local level when you're dealing with the pandemic. So, and then there is a very clear understanding that what is meant by elimination and what is meant by endemic. My personal feel is that it is never be over because once the virus is there, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Azar has already mentioned that I think it might continue. But the challenge for the health systems are that they need to minimize the impact, which I mentioned in my presentation, the direct impact and the collateral damage, which is happening because of the COVID. And I think that is where the challenge is for the health systems, even including Scotland, that we have got excellent data. We have got a already for very mature intelligence IIP in, in, in intelligent infection platform and the all the data is um, uh, collected collated analyzed but most important is we are publishing it so that it become very transparent that people are saying hey, the question is that when it is over then it means that the public and the professionals and the politicians they are looking at the same information and they should be able to say that yes when we for example last week we closed down Aberdeen. The question was asked when it is going to be opened. And we said we are publishing the data every day at five o'clock. And this is the criteria. And I think scale it up uh, on the country level, then scale it up at the world level. At some point, the WHO will decide that, yes, we are out of it. Can I have a question <laughs> to uh, RVC, Professor Gundul Saab? Uh, we would like to know how Corona is affecting medical education at Medical University, King Edward Medical University. Thank you, Dr. Reza. You know, uh, as far as medical education is concerned, we've got undergraduate and the postgraduate. The undergraduate, they are off and they'll be on in 15 September, probably. The postgraduate, they are there and their hands-on training is going on. As far as the undergraduate medical education is concerned, uh, you know, the competency, they are the cognitive, the skills and the effects. As far as the cognitive and knowledge domain is concerned, our professors, they are involved in the online teaching like Google Classroom, the YouTube, Zoom technology, Microsoft technology that is being used and we have covered our curriculum. As far as skill, the way it is concerned, when the classes will be on, we'll see whether their contact and face to face are, are, has to be increased to acquire the desired level of competency. And we are also going to establish the advanced skill lab to cover the skill part. And another important thing is in the long term, we have to assess C in post COVID scenario, uh, whether we have to change our assessment techniques, is there, there is some role of the information technology and on online assessment? Because we tested that technique in our supplementary examination and our students who could not fly back to Pakistan, uh, we did the online assessment. And finally, in the long term, uh, my years, we have to review the curriculum also. Uh, Dr. Adil was mentioning about the public health and the family medicine. We have to, uh, I think, give the importance to these subjects as far as undergraduate uh, curriculum is concerned. And as far as the postgraduate program they are concerned, we have to see how we are going to strengthen our uh, program of intensive care, emergency medicine, and infectious disease. So probably King Edward Medical University is on as far as under and postgraduate uh, they are concerned, their academics, their training, their monitoring, 
their assessment according to the uh, new uh, challenging circumstances. If I may ask a question to uh, Professor Gondal, uh, which is a follow-up to the medical care provider. Can I ask you, uh, you you've been the biggest center, I think, in the heart dealing with the corona admissions. Um, what lessons do you think we have learned if there is a second wave, especially during the winter? Are we better able now than we were before uh, during the last uh, spike of infection? Other, I think uh, Dr. Faisal Sultan has very nicely elaborated all the statistics. And I personally feel government of Pakistan and Punjab, they were well prepared. We are the first case on 26 February, and we started our preparation in the form of the training courses and other things like the, uh, the quarantine center, the isolation center, the HDU, the ICU, at the level of the King Edward Medical University and Mayo Hospital, we had 410 beds already prepared. And probably I feel the preparation at the level of the government and at the level of the medical profession, they were adequate and obviously we have learned a lessons and God forbid if we are having the second wave, we are well prepared as far as all these, they are, they are concerned. But by the grace of Allah Almighty, as far as King Edward and the Adash Hospital, they are concerned. We are comfortable now on Eid al-Fitr. We had 200 plus patients admitted in Mayo Hospital. And on Eid al-Zha, they were, I think, the fall back up to 17. And today figure is 28. And I personally feel uh, they are, uh, as far as the KE is concerned, as far as health delivery system is concerned, we are comfortable. We are prepared with 500 plus beds even now. And occupancy is less than 10%. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gondal. A question for Professor Saira Afzal. I know we've talked about preparing the public health workforce for future, but in terms of this being part of medical curriculum or for undergraduate medical education, are there any plans to see how we prepare the future workforce for the graduates coming out of the system? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this very important thing as we have seen that the main focus has been changed from the curative side to the preventive side. As we were the students of King Edward Medical College, our more of the classes and our focus was more towards treating and managing the patients rather than preventing the, the disease. But with uh, the uh, inception of this university, our programs have been changed and we have a specific curriculum for preventive medicine and we, in the Department of Community Medicine, we have courses for epidemiology, as well as we have undergraduate courses, specially focused on community services, volunteerism, and the students are encouraged to go into the villages, rural health centers, basic health units, and primary health care centers to give their voluntary services to the community. So the preventive medicine has been focused as uh, far as uh, curriculum is concerned, as well, well as we are more towards community-oriented medical education now, and we are more focused towards voluntarism, as Dr. Adil has correctly shown in his presentation, that no nation can move forward unless the uh, volunteers, they move with the nation and they come up with the ideas and voluntarism. So we are doing this in King Edward Medical University. Thank you. I have one question for Dr. Raza. I think it's coming from Professor Bilkis Shabir. Uh, in terms of the effectivity of the vaccine, uh, would it cover all strains, all ages? And uh, there are some questions being asked. Would it last for like years or just for a few months? Well, that's what we have to find out. Um, I think... Um, there's, there are a lot of unknowns here, and you can. Uh, I, I showed you the list of uh, the vaccines which are on uh, on the register at the moment. And if we knew, then we wouldn't need to do any trial. And what I'm hoping for is that if we do develop a vaccine, then it's not like a flu vaccine, which has to be uh, given every year because the strain changes. And it has to be specific to coronavirus too. And uh, although if you do get uh, a, a, a pan coronavirus, then that that will be that will be great. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, let's let's find out uh, as they show the data about efficacy and and safety. I think these are the two key concerns which we have for any vaccine. But I I, I do have reservations about uh, quick vaccines. <laughs> I think we just need to be aware of the chances of companies giving it to us. 
and collecting data on ourselves and then publishing it as our efficacy data and safety data. So I'm, I'm a bit nervous. So Reza, just a follow up, sorry, sorry, just a follow up question for Reza in terms of there is a lot of noise being picked up around test and trace and maybe with a bit of, if we have these sort of clusters happening here and there. So what's your view, view both in terms of UK or maybe how it would apply to Pakistan oh, as well? Uh, test and trace is what Germany did. They, they started off with um, a huge capacity of um, uh, testing and then they followed up everybody. And I think that is the answer really. So if, if the number of cases have gone down tremendously, then the attempt and public health colleagues are better placed in answering this. But that is certainly one of the strategy of controlling it at a, <clears throat> at a population level. And it all depends on how much resource you can throw in, how you, receptive your population is. You know how things go on Eve. This is a UK phenomenon. You know what's happened in Bradford, in Manchester. If people are not listening and they're not uh, self-isolating themselves, then test and trace won't work. It's only where you've got people where you tell them to self-isolate then it will work. Otherwise, there's no point in uh, relying on it. But but it is an effective strategy. That's what we have seen. The number of cases have gone down and we are very heavy handed in tracking those cases. Although the way the government has done it is uh, to be questioned because people are, who are doing it are not paying. Uh, but I think as a strategy, it's, it's quite good. Last two questions, please. I have just a quick question for Professor Bilkis Shabir in terms oh, can of... I just ask? Sorry, go on, go on, Rukrata. Yeah, go ahead, Shabir. Okay, I think it's so just a question for Professor Bilkis Shabir in terms of the various strains of viruses and, and maybe a bit of their experience from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, this is actually one of the questions I put on the chat board because uh, we are not as yet uh, equipped as to know the types of viruses. But this is, uh, I think, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Professor Sultan will agree with me. Uh, at least six to seven strains have been identified worldwide. Now. My question was whether the behavior of each strain is different in each of the communities, number one. And number two, uh, we are facing a slightly different pattern amongst our population because uh, uh, as you know, King Edward Medical University and New Hospital have been the biggest centers. We have seen uh, patients of younger age group presenting without any comorbidities in critical state. So could it be due to the difference in the strain of the virus? And the third part of my question is that could it be that uh, the vaccine that is being formulated, would it be covering all the types of viruses? The viruses would be changing their strains. So this is which keeps on striking. Can we please ask Dr. Raza to... Uh, yeah, I mean... I mean uh, so if you go back to the pandemic uh, which happened, the, the Spanish flu way back in 1920s around the First World War, there are a lot of uh, uh, young deaths in people who were otherwise fit and healthy. And I think it all depends on the immune system more than the virus because the virus strain, my understanding is, wasn't much different. It was how the host behaved. And the cytokine storm I talked about is, is a host dependent phenomena. And people are dying predominantly of viral pneumonias, predominantly of chest infections, predominantly of lung pathologies. So uh, to me, uh, it's more to do with the, the virus strain may have some role to play. But the honest answer, again, is I don't know because there's not much data out there. Um, and the answer to your question about strains, um, again, I would like to believe based on my specialist knowledge is that one uh, vaccine will cover all the strains within coronavirus uh, and that will determine the success of the vaccine. So I think that what they're trying to achieve is a pan cov 2 vaccine. Now, whether it covers all the strain is yet to be found out because we know when they developed the polio vaccine, it wasn't as effective for polio virus 1. The polio virus 2 and 3 were quite okay, but polio virus 1 wasn't covered. And then over the last decades, we've uh, excelled in vaccine development. So now we are at a place where we achieved what you wanted. 
So it may be that to start with, it may not be perfect, but I think as time goes along, then we'll have uh, more opportunity. And again, that goes back to my point about uh, if you fast track something, you always lose, uh, there's a compromise somewhere. Thank you, Raza. Can I ask a last question? One for uh, Dr. Mohammed Abed, who is in Al Ain in the UAE. Uh, just to bring a different perspective to this discussion, because you've worked in a different environment, what has been your experience of the pandemic and uh, where is it going? Followed by a question for Faisal, which is uh, the surveillance in the community. Is it possible to do it uh, scientifically and sensibly uh, in Pakistan? There has been a discussion regarding testing sewage, uh, as we do for polio, for example. So where do you see that? And after these two questions, we'll close uh, this session. Thanks, Dr. Uh, my apology. Uh, do you mind to just remind you, sir, the, 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 the management of uh, pandemic or, or what experience you're referred to? Sorry, I was asking Abid, not Adil. Sorry, Adil. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, thank you Adil, for asking me this question. It's a very interesting question. Uh, so I think what my experience is in the whole is um, that unless you had the good surveillance systems in place and the very trained public health workforce, the, any system is going to fall. So what we have in the UK, for example, I think there was an earlier question about the uh, pandemic uh, preparedness. So in the UK, we've been preparing for the pandemic influenza for the last many years, and that plan is reviewed every two years. So although we had a system in the UK, but still there were a lot of problems when we're dealing with uh, COVID-19. So we are learning all the time. So I think that that's the more important thing. So the way forward thing is to have the good public health system and have a trained public health workforce and then we communicate with our stakeholders that how we are going to implement if the things do go wrong. So I think that's my proposal would be to focus on more on infrastructure and then the further actions will fall later on. Thank you. Thank you. Faisal, uh, tell us about the community surveillance in Pakistan. Is it feasible? Certainly feasible. I think uh, what, what, what's required is um, Again, a well thought through process, which is based on principles of epidemiology and public health, and uh, not just uh, you know a little blunderbuss or casual approach to it. So um, a large survey was put in place. You will be seeing the results of it pretty soon. Now this is a zero survey as opposed to a PCR, um, and uh, you, I think within the next few weeks you will have preliminary results of this from all across Pakistan. Some variations across different dimensions. The other important uh, systemic uh, surveillance that is crucial, I think, is as we open schools, uh, I think that sentinel sites would need to be chosen to actually evaluate. On, a, on an ongoing basis, uh, the, the uh, presence or the development of new infections, uh, and I think that will guide further steps because uh, this may require a rethink or a redo somewhere in October when the effect of the school opening or the uh, educational opening comes into play. So I think these are the two, the zero surveillance, uh, as well as active surveillance around high risk areas. Uh, so far, Pakistan has had uh, openings without difficulty other than the, than the previous seed. Uh, but I think from here on, it is very crucial, especially I think schools, because the number of people, number of individuals involved in that process are in the tens of millions. Thank you very much uh, to everybody. Excellent panel discussion. We will be taking a 10 minutes break before we bring more experts for uh, and more talks and um, inshallah we'll be back. So we're going to take a break. Uh, people can uh, refresh themselves, uh, enjoy tea at your home and, uh, couple, and see you soon. Thank you very much.